The Clock Strikes 12. It's Good Design, Bad Design, Volume 12. Like always, we're taking a look at graphic design in games. Things like menus, UI, UX, color choice, font choice, animation, character design, anything that deals with the presentation of information. Remember that these segments aren't game reviews. Bad graphic design can show up in good games and vice versa. Today, we're prepared to deliver four parts. After watching them all, stop by the comments and let us know of any hot new good designs and scary old bad design candidates you've seen around. New ones are tough to find, but there's one thing scarier than bad typography. Cassette tapes. Oh, wait. It's today's spooky episode sponsor, The Magnus Archives. It's a very popular horror anthology podcast. Think of the game Control or the SCP Foundation, but an audio drama. It's won a zillion awards. It has millions of downloads and a devoted cult. Fandom. Cult fandom. Examine what lurks in the archives of the Magnus Institute, an organization devoted to researching the esoteric and weird. Individually, the episodes are unsettling, and together they form a horrifying picture. As they explore the depths of the archives, something starts to look back. What is it? You'll find out soon enough. They're gearing up for the thrilling finale on March 25th, 2021. So now's the perfect time to jump in. Open your podcast app of choice and search the Magnus Archives or go to RustyQuill.com to get started. Go listen. Good Design There's a tension between how immersive your game world is and how much UI the game uses. Often, the more intrusive your UI, the less immersive the game world tends to be. But minimal UIs come at a cost, too. Games with minimal menus are tougher to design. Take level selects, for example. It can be tougher than you'd think to make a level select diegetic, where it's a natural part of your game world. The concept of a level select often just doesn't fit in neatly. It's a convenient catch-all technique to just stick the level select in a menu, but they can be a little klutzy to the aesthetic your game is trying to build. Knowing just what to shove in a menu and how much to create within your game world is a tricky balance and every game designer has to decide where on the spectrum their game fits best. The Mario series has gone on for so long that you can see Nintendo experiment with the level select system in each game, and watch what happens as the pendulum swings back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. Mario 1 and 2 were very linear games, with just a few secrets that let players skip ahead, but not really much of a level select system. Mario 3 was the start of how the course clear style Mario games would be structured, where it implemented an actual level select as a collection of world maps. They have themed menus with nodes located everywhere you could play. To help keep the world maps more interesting, they included features like the mushroom houses and airships that added variety to how you progressed through the game. Super Mario World went further, with a single interconnected world map divided into multiple regions, and cranked up the number of hidden paths to find through secret exits. There was even an entire extra Star World with crazy bonus stages if you could find it. But there was always a very clear distinction in that era between where you selected a level and where you played a level. That would change as the pendulum swung first in the transition to 3D. The level selection changed from the linear course clear style to more of an open sandbox. Mario 64 had no overworld map. Instead, it had one of the first immersive hub worlds, where menu and core gameplay were fused together. Instead of selecting level nodes, you find portals to stages in a castle full of secrets. There was still a little bit of a distinction between menu and game as you selected a star upon entering a course, but the lines were blurring. It's not as efficient to navigate as the earlier menus, but the hub becomes a fun stage in itself, as interesting as any others. It cut out having to return frequently to the menu screen, which kept you in the same mode of play for longer, and added a new exploration element to deepen the experience. Mario Sunshine polished the same approach, but the hub world style wouldn't stick around forever either. The pendulum swung back towards course clear in Mario Galaxy, which used a solar map system that packed multiple stages into domes that you'd access from the hub. Starting with New Super Mario Bros, Nintendo leaned more and more on the course clear style for the next decade. The New Super Mario Bros sequels, Galaxy 2, and the Super Mario 3D series went back to the Mario 3 world map concept and simplified it. Fewer secrets, more of a straight stage select, but the pendulum swung again. In 2017, Mario Odyssey would mix the hub world style back in a little more, 
The main levels were presented in a linear list on a world map, but the levels themselves were similar to the hubs of Mario 64 and Sunshine. Sandbox-style objectives mixed with multiple secret portals to isolated gauntlet stages that looked a lot like what you'd find in the Course Clear games. But even as the series was leaning more towards the hub world style, it hadn't embraced minimal menus as much as it could have. Going between stages was never seamless. The Star and Shine Select menus in Mario 64 and Sunshine weren't very intrusive, but if you could remove those last vestiges of a menu, you could have a more naturally flowing adventure. And so they did, with Bowser's Fury. It has no level select menu at all. Instead, every individual level lives in a seamless open world design that you can traverse freely. You can flow from objective to objective without ever stopping to head back to a menu. With the change, the game world is a lot more sprawling, so they needed to add better navigation features. The sections of the world use landmarks to help get your bearings. Every stage starts with this little cat-shaped arch, and the end is marked with a lighthouse, which works as a vantage point that lets you see the start of the next stage from the top. The Gigabell statues that are placed between the levels also provide solid anchor points for each of the three major regions of the world. With these landmarks alongside the distinct designs of the levels themselves, as well as Fury Bowser's shell at the center, it's next to impossible to get lost. Traveling between the islands is super smooth thanks to being able to ride on Plessy who is always just around the corner no matter where you are. At no point while playing are you taken out of the usual Mario gameplay to go fiddle with a menu, and neither are you missing the convenience of the menus they've taken out. Nintendo spent the time to lay out the stages and set landmarks to make the menu redundant, with only a fast travel option once you've cleared the game. For taking the time to make the world seamless, Bowser's Fury has become my favorite Mario world to travel through. Bad design. Typography. For text boxes, goal number one is to make the text as readable as possible. Goal number two is to do it in style. It's easy to only focus on the second goal though. Style is fun, but style that breaks readability destroys the entire purpose of the text in the first place. Almost every standard typeface will fit the first goal just fine, so it's easy to assume that a font is automatically readable. But that's survivorship bias in action. Any typeface that survives long enough to become popular will also tend to be very readable. If you're making your own custom font for stylistic purposes, you're sailing in uncharted waters. And the fastest way to get eaten by a typographic sea snake is to take a display font and use it for everything. Display fonts are the typefaces you see for things like titles and logos. They can be simple, but they're usually customized to hell and back to evoke a particular style. You might want to combine just the right kind of serif, line weight, geometricity, and dangly effects and flourishes to fit with exactly what your game is all about. I've got someone I'd like you to meet. His name is Vex, and he's an 18-year-old platformer. The early 2000s overflowed with edgy platformers. The successful Jack 2, the less successful Shadow the Edge Edge, and the much, much less successful Vex. I like to call it Super Blario 64. They even stole the Metal Mario power-up. But let me tell you, the game made some typographic choices. Look at that display font in the logo. Points everywhere, a unique ligature to join the two X's together. It evokes a generic fantasy edge vibe. It's fine as a display font. It wouldn't be right as a dialogue box font, so they didn't use it. Instead, they made a totally different crazy custom font that's not suitable for dialogue text. The dialogue in Vex shows up as alien glyphs that rotate letter by letter into the actual letter form. It's meant to suggest seeing a foreign language being translated right in front of you, but it feels more like a bad PowerPoint animation choice. The effect loses its impact very quickly, but it'll be there for the whole game. The body text font itself is also custom, and also not great. The text is in small caps, where every letter is a capital, but the actual capitals are just scaled up a little. In tone, it looks like everyone in the game is shouting. To emphasize specific words, games will usually either change text color, or sometimes they will use all capital letters. Guess which one Vex decided to do. It shouts louder. All caps on small caps. It doesn't contrast nearly well enough to be effective. In normal text, the font isn't very readable either. There's inconsistent kerning, different line weights on the anatomy of every letter form, and mismatched baselines and heights. 
Look at this W and this R to get the sampler pack of all the typography mistakes here. It's possible to use the font for a style, but for long stretches of text, it's more challenging to read than it needs to be. Even if you like the way the font looks, the inconsistencies aren't contributing much to the style. So cleaning up the font a little would make the end result much nicer. Vex's font choices aren't so bad to make the text unreadable. They were going for flair, and in small doses like in the logo, their choices make more sense. But for long stretches of text, the inconsistencies outweigh the charm, and make the game's presentation feel sloppy. Good design. How does something become better than the sum of its parts? The easiest way is to have those parts support and play off of each other. I've been playing some Opus Magnum lately. Another one is Zektronics games like Space Chem, where you build a machine to make little molecules one bond at a time. Something like Baby's first chemical kinetics, I guess. It's fun, and there's some excellent UI in the end screen histograms that show you how efficient your machines are compared with your friends and the rest of the world. But that's a topic for another day. I want to talk about how Opus Magnum melds its animation and soundtrack through its clockwork design. Some games work with their soundtrack more than others, of course. Any rhythm game is built around things happening in time with the music. A game like Opus Magnum, though, doesn't strictly need to do that to work. The gameplay is built around elements of a machine moving in precise timing, moving mechanical arms that hand elements off to each other, and do so as quickly, or in the smallest area, or with the fewest number of parts as possible. The fun is in figuring out how this dance will work, so the machinery bits don't collide together by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Once you figure it out, you can make that dance again, but faster, or smaller, or cheaper, without stepping on anyone's toes. If you get it right, you can make some stunningly beautiful machines. The game even comes with a built-in gift maker to show off your work, and they can be hypnotizing to watch. But the thing that elevates it all is how the animations work in rhythm with its soundtrack. Since the game is so tied to rhythm and timing, it's natural that its animation meshes nicely with its music and sound effects. The soundtrack always feels like it's going along with the animation. The way a successful machine speeds up in time, the music choice that is fairly heavy on percussion, the on-the-beat impacts of a completed molecule going into storage, the chirps when a new bond is formed. Even the collisions when you screw something up just feel on time. It's viscerally satisfying and adds detail that wasn't required to get the game finished, but made it feel far more polished. The game might look chaotic at first, but the attention to detail to sync the audio and visuals helps make Opus Magnum a finely tuned machine. Bad design. The Witcher games are beloved for their compelling stories and characters, but it's no secret that getting into the series is an uphill battle. Most players start with either the second or third game, and that's for a good reason. The first Witcher is a rough start. The last two games are outstanding, and the devs spent a lot of time polishing them both, but the first game is missing a lot of that polish. Check out these layouts. The one weird trick to getting a decent looking layout is to have consistency. There needs to be some internal logic in the placement, spacing, alignment, and order of elements, and you have to stick with it. You can stray from those rules to make a point, but it'll start to make the whole layout look sloppy if you do it at random. Menus that look chaotic but appealing will usually have some consistency if you look hard enough for it. The Witcher's menus fall flat because of a bunch of little inconsistencies. The menus have this quasi Xbox Blades radial design that only uses two thirds of the screen. The hero menu has stat categories that half heartedly follow the curve. They don't align with the curve of the background image, nor with each other. The inventory screen conforms to the curve design the least. It sticks to a more grid based structure and probably is the best looking menu in isolation. But it doesn't really look like part of the set. It's not a super pretty menu. Some elements are misaligned, and this gross red motif muddies things up a bit, but it does its job relatively fine. The journal menu holds some of the weirdest and least consistent design choices. It's divided into 8 submenus for different game concepts, and each is just a little off. 
The lists on the left ignore the radial background and are just left aligned. Some submenus have little green buttons that sort quests by chapter, and they follow this decorative wavy line. Sort of. Some other buttons are squared up in a grid. The alchemy screen even has elements that just go off of the background entirely. It's not just the alignments that are inconsistent. Each submenu uses a decorative picture that fits with its category, but the choices seem kind of weird. The quest menu shows half of a face on the left, but another menu will use a less cropped version of the same picture on the right. This is the only image on the left side for some reason. The locations, glossary, and tutorials tab all just use Geralt's face as a decoration. They aren't all unique, and they aren't all the same, seemingly at random. It undercuts the decorative flourish the element is supposed to provide, so why have it there at all? The decorative elements don't look that great anyway, and make the text above them harder to read. It's going for… something, but it's not coming together. The UI isn't just full of clunky decoration, it's functionally weird too. Many HUD elements are too small to see easily, especially if you're trying to play the game from a couch. This HUD is organized pretty well, stats info in the upper left, icons for your gear under that, and some sensible hierarchy in how sub-icons show up in combat for the stances you can swap between. It's just that the buttons are so tiny. There's a ton of empty space the icons could use, should use, but don't use. The other UI elements have plenty of their own quirks too. The minimap is a micro-map, letting you only see a small portion of the world. The battle text is tiny, the sword icon the combo system depends on is tiny, the staz buff icons are faded too much, Almost every part of the UI feels just barely off, and the small issues add up. The Witcher's menus are a death by a thousand tiny cuts to create a UI that could have used another pass.